Welcome to the Waters and Stanton video channel. My name is Peter Waters, G3OJV. One of the good things about summer, from a ham radio point of view, of course, is that um, it opens up the opportunity for portable operation. And what I'm going to do is to talk about HF portable operation. If you're a beginner um, into HF portable operation, there's a few things that perhaps uh, it's worth knowing and may help you to get uh, some good results quicker than you would otherwise do. So let's uh, start with um, the most important thing is what sort of bands are you going to operate on? Well, my favourite bands tend to be uh, 40 metres and 20 metres. <clears throat> I think you can write off 160 metres because antennas need to be fairly large to be efficient and for sort of the normal day portable operation it's not really possible. 80 metres is more doable but again there is a problem there and that is the band tends not to be particularly good um, during the day. I mean it does work but you, again you need a reasonable antenna. And again, if it's just a, we're just talking about a daytime operation, you know, just a sort of day out for a few hours, again, a decent 80 meter antenna um, is quite a length of wire. Um, short uh, 80 meter whips tend not to work very well because they are short, therefore, they're not very efficient. And at the same time, you've got band conditions which um, are not always particularly good um, in terms of a strong signal. So, I I would tend to um, migrate down to 40 and 20. Now both those bands tend to be open most of the day and uh, certainly 40 is open sort of 24 hours usually. 20 metres will close uh, in the evening but probably by that time you're packed up anyway. So in between you've got um, the 30 metre band but unless you're a CW operator or you're operating data that really is not going to be terribly um, uh, important to you. So the two bands um, I would recommend are 20 and 40. Don't write off um, 17 metres because that can open up and when it does open up it's capable of very very good results. Um, it's quite um, possible you can work across the Atlantic to the States on 17 metres but only when the bands open. Uh, the other bands going further up uh, towards um, uh, 12 metres and 10 metres, those bands will only be open at the moment if there's sporadic E. Otherwise, they're not likely to be open. Now, the problem with sporadic E is that it is sporadic. You never know when it's going to happen. It will happen for half an hour, three or four hours. It's totally unpredictable, apart from the fact that it normally happens in the spring. Um, and so from May, say, to July, um, those bands will spring open occasionally. Um, to a lesser extent, um, around about Christmas time, but of course, portable operation is not very popular at Christmas time anyway, so I think we can, we can write that off. Um, for HF portable operation, there is one other um, thing that you need to be aware of, and that is that the sunspot cycle. We are... Um, really at the bottom of the sunspot cycle now. This, re this video has been recorded in June 2020. And we are actually at the bottom of the sunspot cycle. So things can only get better. So it's, a, it's an extra challenge. Uh, but the good news is things can only get better. Um, and as uh, we progress um, over the next year or so, we should um, see some uh, improvement in results. Anyway, that's the situation with um, choosing bands and um, I hope that's given you some sort of guide. Now let's let's talk about equipment. Um, it really doesn't matter, you can use whatever you like, uh, but there are things that uh, are attractive and the things that are less attractive. If you're going to go out for the day and just operate for two or three hours then you really want to make sure the gear is light. Um, that probably means that uh, you need to operate at around about the 10 watt, 10 or 15 watt power level so that you don't need large batteries. The equipment is fairly compact and small and um, the whole thing is more enjoyable because you're not lugging heavy great bits and pieces around. 
Some people take uh, uh, larger transceivers around, operate on lower power um, with uh, batteries. Um, it's a personal choice. Um, I tend to favour lightweight equipment because, as I say, it's, uh, it's easy to take around. I mean, the, the popular radios are the Ellicraft KX2, the Ellicraft KX3. Both those radios will give uh, 10 watts out, so the KX3 will give you 15 watts out on uh, uh, all bands up to 20 meters. Uh, the discontinued IC703 is a, is a good radio. Um, there's not, those, not too many of those about. Um, it does have the attract, attraction of a built-in ATU, so the IC703 is, a, is one to look at. But really and truly, it doesn't matter what you take, um, provided that you don't mind carrying the weights about. Uh, certainly you can get some very small batteries these days which will give out a decent amount of power so um, that is uh, also an attraction. Now when it comes to modes of operation I suppose the majority will operate a single sideband because um, it's a very popular mode and all the radios cover it. Uh, if you uh, operate CW, then you have a bit of a, an advantage because CW tends to be uh, better um, in low signal conditions and noisy conditions. So whereas a sideband signal may not really get through um, to have a proper QSO, uh, certainly a CW signal stands a better chance. So if you are a CW operator, then CW is a great, um, a great mode to use. And of course, in, to some extent, it makes the gear uh, that much more compact. You can get CW-only transceivers, you can build your own or whatever. But um, certainly from a results point of view, you're more likely to get better results on CW than sideband. Now, I don't want to put you off sideband because lots and lots of operators do operate SSB very successfully for port portable operation, but it's just fair to underline the fact that CW will give you the edge. Data is another possibility. Um, I personally find data um, operating portable is a bit of a pain because you very often can't really see the computer screen that well. And so um, it's, uh, it, it tends to be, from my point of view, a bit of a non-starter. As regards the time of the day to operate, there is no good and bad time really, provided it's in daylight hours. It's sensible just to check the bands um, if you can before you leave because it's not unknown for 20 meters to close um, because of uh, radio conditions. So just check if you're going to go on 20 meters, that band is open. 40 meters, usually open, but again, it makes sense just to check the band conditions. I mean, if there's been a blackout, there's obviously no point in going portable because if you can't hear them on a base station transceiver, you're not going to hear them or work them on a, on a portable setup. So it's always wise to just check, check the, uh, the band conditions. Now as regards um, selecting a site for HF portable operation, uh, if you live near the coast, then operating near the coast is beneficial because um, you'll get better results because you'll be near the salt water, you'll get um, better reflection and uh, it's always an advantage to be operating near the coast. So if you can get near the coast, particularly if you can get really near the waterfront, um, then that's good. Um, rivers don't really carry much advantage, but if you can get near a salt water um, spot, um, i.e. a coastal spot, then certainly it is advantageous and um, I've had some very, very good results from there. It's not really an advantage to be on high ground from my experience. Um, you can operate uh, in a valley or up on a hill. There's not too much difference. Certainly if you're in Scotland, a bit different because you talk about mountains. But if you're just talking about hills, it doesn't really matter whether you're on the top of a hill or near the bottom of the hill. My experience is that the, uh, the, the results are, are very similar. Um, do look for power lines, not from only from a safety point of view, but power lines do usually mean noise. So if you're going to set up a portable site and you see some power lines nearby, think again, choose another site because it's almost certain that you're going to get some noise from those power lines and that's not what you want, want 
you want. I mean, one of the good things about portable operation is the fact you can get away from noise. I, I know a lot of you, uh, when you're operating at home, have all sorts of problems with noise. We all have problems with noise to some degree or other. And if you're out portable, then you have got away from that noise. And so it's quite a relief to get away from the noisy environment and just see what you can actually hear and work. You might be pleasantly surprised. I know when I've been up in Scotland, when I've been up in the Orkneys and the Shetlands, uh, sometimes you think, wait a minute, have I, is the receiver working? And you pull the aerial out and put the aerial in and you can hear the noise increase. But it's only a small amount. And uh, in fact, it works the opposite way because the frustration is that you call a station and they don't hear you because they've got an S7 noise level and you've got an S1 or S2 noise level. So you can hear them, they can't hear you, but there we are. Um, there's pluses and minuses for low noise level, but certainly if you're going to go out portable, you have the advantage of operating in a low noise environment. Now when it comes to antennas, that's really a subject all of its own. Uh, antennas for portable operation, there's endless um, uh, varieties and choices you can make. Uh, you can either have horizontal or vertical or loops and there's pluses and minuses for all those antennas. Um, just be aware that there is no magic antenna. A magic an antenna doesn't exist. All antennas were based on theory and it um, doesn't matter what um, name you give to them, you might give them some fanciful names, but a fanciful name doesn't make an antenna any better than one that's just got a number or one that hasn't got a number at all. I mean, the dipole is the sort of basis of so many antennas, and you can call that dipole what you like, but a dipole is a dipole. So don't get too um, embroiled in thinking that because it's got a fanciful name, it must be better than something else. That's not the case. There is no magic antenna. They are all based around theory and the construction, and a short aerial doesn't work as well as a long aerial and a high aerial works better than a low aerial. That's basic antenna theory. So don't get um, too um, confused with names that are given to antennas. For quick portable setup, um, I tend to uh, favour a, uh, a loaded whip, base loaded or centre loaded whip because they generally speaking very easy to set up. And if it looks like rain, you don't want to have a fanciful aerial up in the air. So um, I've often operated in a field with a short vertical antenna, short loaded vertical antenna for 40 meters or 20 meters, seems to work extremely well. However, however, when we get to 40 meters, a typical loaded whip is quite short and you are likely to get better results if you can erect it um, with a horizontal wire. Now, followers of this channel will know that I'm a great, I'm a great fan of end-fed half waves because they work so wonderfully well and they're so easy to erect. Um, and I would say that if you're going to, if you're going to operate on 40 meters and you've got the room to do it, I would put up a 40 meter end fed half wave. Now, even if that center of that antenna is only eight or 10 foot above the ground, it will probably give better results than a short loaded vertical. The advantage of a short loaded vertical is that it's short, it's compact, and um, in some cases just sort of fits in your pocket or your bag. But the advantage of a longer wire is that it is more efficient it gives some good high angle radiation and high angle radiation is what will give you results when you're operating portable because you're going to operate during the day on 40 meters and conditions probably are going to favor short to medium skip you're not going to get any dx and if there is any dx you probably won't work it because you're only running low power but you will get some good signals um, and receive and you'll be able to transmit some good signals on transmit with high angle which will which will play right into the uh, state of the sort of short skip or medium skip on 40 meters so uh, I would say um, if you can get a horizontal wire up on 40 meters do so 
don't worry that it's low because it, it will still work. Um, and if you end feed it, you've got no kx feed to worry about, and um, it's um, it's a nice it's a nice antenna. It, it works, and I tell you that from experience. Now on 20 meters, of course, um, a whip becomes more efficient, and uh, so I've I've had lots of contacts using uh, um, a 20 meter loaded whip. Um, I mean, you can actually have a full size quarter wave. Um, for 20 meters because it's only what five meters tall so you could have a telescopic whip uh, MFJ do a telescopic whip which extends to a quarter wave on 20 meters what better than a full-size um, antenna on 20 meters except except there's always exceptions and except that a vertical tends to give sort of low angle radiation and what you really want is higher angle radiation so I would still say don't dismiss, don't dismiss the um, horizontal antenna that um, will give you sort of high angle radiation. You can either use an end fed or a dipole. So I think for 20 meters, um, either a vertical or a horizontal antenna um, is a good choice. Uh, as I say, I tend to favor verticals um, if I'm going to just operate for a half hour or an hour or so, particularly if you're near the, near the uh, coast. Um, but if I feel a bit more ambitious and I've got the room, I would certainly consider putting up a uh, half wave um, for 20 meters end fed. Don't forget, of course, that if you have an end fed half wave for 40 meters, it would also resonate on 20 meters. So if you're gonna go down the half wave route, which is one of the other attractions of half waves, is Consider an end-fed half-wave resonant on 40 metres, it will also resonate on 20 metres, give you very good results. And one of the things you can do um, with portable operation, of course, is that you, you can operate from the car. I mean, sometimes if it's raining or it's pretty awful, or it's windy or it's horrible or it's cold, you can operate from a uh, car. And I'm going to show you now an antenna system which I think is great for portable operation when you want to operate from the car. So let's, let's take a closer look at this. Well, the antenna that's kept me company over many HF portable trips is the Buddy Stick. Now the Buddy Stick, I think is pretty well known. If you go onto our website, you can see uh, the details of the Buddy Stick made in America. It's been around for about 20 years now, um, but I use it in a, uh, a slightly uh, different way than perhaps a lot of people do. Let me uh, just show you, this, this is the buddy stick, um, the heart of the buddy stick really is the, uh, this lovely coil, nicely made, and um, it uh, uses 3 8 inch uh, um, screw threaded connection, so you've got a, a 3 8 inch uh, uh, thread there and uh, socket there. Um, you also get the um, uh, telescopic whip with it, uh, which um, telescopes around about it's over a meter, yes, well over a meter, I think, about one and a half meters. Turn that down. Um, you also get with it two. I suppose we call them mast sections really, they screw together like that. Uh, 3 8 inch um, again, if we can get the uh, things lined up there. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that's the mast section. Uh, joined together like that. And uh, the uh, coil screws in like that. And then on top of the coil goes the uh, whip. And the interesting thing about the buddy stick is to change frequency you effectively adjust the turns on the coil and this is done by shorting out. Now you might be able to see this um, close up from here but I have done a separate close up. Um, the uh, little tiny connectors there go onto the uh, side of the coil but they, they, they connect very firmly and then effectively 
what you've got is a coil that's been shorted out. Now, at the top end there, a lot of the coil will be shorted out, so that would, say, be 10 metres. Um, down the bottom, hardly anything shorted out at all. That will be 40 metres, and then all stations in between um, will uh, cover the various bands. <laughs> a neat little trick, actually, is that if you just run this up and down the coil, you get some idea of where the tap needs to be anyway. There are marks on here, suggested marks, but if you run this up and down, you can actually hear the signals peaking up. So it's uh, quite an interesting um, little, uh, little tip. Anyway, the buddy stick. The key to what I'm going to talk about is 3 8 inch. Now, the buddy stick is often used on a tripod. Um, it can also be used um, on a uh, table with a uh, little sort of adjustable mount and so forth. And it comes with a counterpoise which um, you can adjust the length of according to the band you're going to operate on. All very standard, logical and very well known I'm sure. But when I go portable now I tend to make use of the car. Now, I used to cycle quite a lot, I don't cycle much now, I have to say. The advantage of using the car is that you can drive to places fairly quickly, um, and if it's raining, you are dry, and uh, you've got a 12 volt power supply there. The good thing about it is that there's also a big chunk of metal. Now, what I have done for quite a while now is to make the car part of the antenna system. In other words, the car becomes the ground plane. So how do you mount the buddy stick onto a car? Well, if you go onto our website, we do various magnetic mounts, some of which have got a 3 8 inch socket. That means to say that you could mount this coil straight onto a magnetic mount and then with a telescopic whip um, above it you've got a base loaded antenna. You could add the bottom mast sections and you have a sort of a center loaded antenna. The good thing about it is that it tunes all bands it's very efficient because it's got a very nicely made coil and so you can just quickly adjust it to whatever band you want to operate on. Let me explain the magnetic mount because I know some of the uh, newcomers may think, well, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah, but where's the earth connection? Let's go back to basic radio theory. If you put a magnetic mount onto a car, you've got a coax cable going to it. The center connection goes to the socket on the magnetic mount which, into which the antenna screws. So the center connector is connected to the antenna, the vertical antenna in this case. The sheath is connected to a metal plate at the base of the magnetic mount. In other words, the whole of the base of the magnetic mount has got a, sh a thin sheet of metal um, to which is attached the shield of the um, coax. And then immediately below that there's a, sh there's a short sort of membrane of rubber or plastic, whatever, to stop it scratching the car. So you might say, okay, how does the sheathing of the coax make contact with the metal on the car? Because we know that we need a ground plane for a vertical. How does it make the connection? Because if you put a DC meter on there, it'll be open circuit. Well, the answer is that when you put a magnetic mount onto the roof of a car, you've got a metal membrane there, um, and also you've got the paintwork of the car. So there is no uh, direct metallic connection between the magnet mount and the car. But it's very close and it basically is a capacitor because that's how a capacitor works. You have plates or lots of um, uh, sort of, um, well, windings if you like. And a capacitor 
is formed by two surfaces which are very close together. Now, when they are close enough and when there's enough surface, radio frequencies can, can travel straight down to the metallic part of the car. In other words, you've got a capacitor between the magnetic mount and the car. If the magnet, magnet, magnetic mount is a reasonable size, it will certainly work okay on 20 meters and, and higher. Um, and as I say, although there's no DC connection, there is a, an earth connection because of the capacity. If you want to operate on lower frequencies, you really need a larger magnetic mount to make it work satisfactorily. And the way to do that is one of the three-way magnetic mounts that uh, we do. And again, you, you'll see those on our website. Now, coming back to the, um, the actual buddy stick, you'll see, um, I think there's a close-up here, um, of the connection, or the tapping on the coil and so forth, so you, you can see how it, how it all works. Um, and as I say, on our website, you've got details of the magnetic mounts. You don't necessarily need to be in the car. It's a nice day, nice sunny day. You don't need to be in the car. What you do is you put the antenna into the mag mount on the roof of the car, and that coax cable, you can, if it's long enough, um, you can use it on a table just outside the car, or it's not long enough, put an extension on. Um, and you have then a ready-made antenna system. The antenna system being the car and the whip. And as I say, if it's a nice sunny day, or you want to be outside, um, then just run that coax into the radio on the side of the road, in a park, or in a wooded area, wherever you manage to park your car, and you have a nice, portable system and if it starts to rain you can take it inside take the gear inside and still operate and of course you have the benefit of a 12 volt system in the car which may well be convenient for you to power your transceiver that is the system that i have operated quite a lot now i take the point that if you've got a rucksack and you want up to, up to the top of a mountain no, top of it, no you can't do it you can't do it but there's a lot of occasions where you've got a spare hour, uh, you've got an hour to spare, and you want to go and operate. Well, this is one way of doing it. I have found, now I haven't done the A-B com comparisons, but I have found that the results with the buddy stick on the roof of a car seems to be better than the buddy stick and a counterpoise. Um, I think it's because the car is a massive great chunk of metal. And even though, even though, even though the car, car panels are not directly connected, there is capacity there, there is capacity, and it all seems to work. Um, and uh, as I say, it's a very convenient way of operating. So that's the way that I operate Portal these days. It works well, it's, it's an all-weather system, and as I say, if you want to get outside, you can get outside, take the, take the gear outside on the table or on the grass or on a picnic rug, I don't know, whatever, whatever. There we are. So that's it. That's my take on HF portable operation. It's not the only way. There's plenty of other ways of doing it, but it's the way that I have done it. And uh, if you're thinking of operating portable, then do consider that way. Now, one, one warning. Do not use the buddy stick as a mobile antenna on the car while you're on the move, because it's not really designed for that. Um, it's not weatherproof. I mean, the coil, it, well, it, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, the coil is, is exposed to the elements. So if it rains, you're going to get water on the coil. It doesn't really matter in terms of um, short term. You can, you can always sort of wipe it down. Um, it's clearly, water on the coil will, will detune it. Um, but uh, that's one of the things that uh, happens anyway. And uh, uh, if, it's, if it is raining a lot, then you'll have to wait, wait till it eases up a bit um, and then wipe the coal down. I have operated in the rain and actually haven't noticed a great deal of difference. It, it seems to work, but there we are. So that's my take on the on HF portable operation. I hope it's been useful to you. If it has uh, and you don't subscribe, please subscribe to this channel because we we'll try to bring all sorts of ideas to you. And I enjoy reading the feedback and I've said before and I'll say again that um, because there is so much feedback and because there's so much e so many emails, I can't possibly reply to them all. I do I do read them and I do take note. Um, I do I do reply to some, but 
please don't be disappointed or think that I'm ignoring you. It's not the case at all. It's the fact that reading them is quite quick. Replying is a slower process and it does take time and I can't really wade through them all. There we are. So thanks for watching this video. Um, if you've got any, uh, any technical questions or um, you're thinking of buying the buddy stick or some other bits and pieces or some transceivers or whatever, um, we'll be happy to talk to you. Our staff down at Portsmouth are all uh, experienced hammer operators and they'll be happy to guide you through. So until the next time, thanks for watching. Take care. Bye for now.